There's a lot of good songs, but my, that's a good song. Amen. You got your Bibles this morning. Turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. I got to get there my, myself. Luke chapter 22 and Acts chapter 17. Luke chapter 22 and Acts chapter 17. I, I love preaching. I, I have, I never, um, you know, many PKs, many pastors, kids grow up having a strong desire to preach the gospel. I never did. I, I never did. Um, I, and, and, and maybe to my shame, um, I, I enjoyed music. Uh, I put it a high priority over a lot of things, more than I should have, I'm sure. <clears throat> and I studied music, <clears throat> not college, but I mean like I spent time on instruments, learning them, and, 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 I, and I love that. But I so wish that I could go back and just take, if I just take a fraction of all those hours I spent on a banjo and just put it towards learning the Word of God. I wish I could go back and do that. And I'm sure every one of us in here could go back and say, man, I wish I wouldn't have spent so much time doing fill in the blank. Just spent more time in the Word of God. Because what really matters at the end of the day is our walk with Christ, the Bible that we know. The more Bible that we know, the greater our worship is. The greater our, our relationship with our spouses. The greater our relationship with our children, our workplace. Just our lives are better when we know the Scriptures. Let alone we're not ashamed for having an answer for what we believe in. Amen. Amen. But uh, I, I love the word of God. I've never had a desire until I believe with all my heart God gave me a desire. And um, uh, I, I really didn't ever, ever want to be a pastor. And, and I, I think people don't believe me, but I really, really didn't. <laughs> uh, because I know what pastors go through. I knew what pastors go through. Um, as close as you can get without being one. And I, and I know that it's just, uh, it's not all sunshine and roses, amen, although it can be, but um, um, amen, I'm just thankful that God's allowed me to be here this morning in spite of who I am and uh, whatever background I think I might have, it's so unworthy to be preaching the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Luke chapter 22, the, the, this, this context right here in the scripture, this is right before the Last Supper. This is, this is right before Gethsemane, the, being in the garden. And can you imagine what was on the mind of Christ? It doesn't take much to imagine. I mean, we're talking about for the last 4,000 years, essentially at this point in time, this is the most pinnacle point in all of history. Amen. As far as mankind's concerned. You know, I think I can add that deeper and say the most pinnacle point in all of history because this is when God sent his son to die on that cruel cross. So not just for mankind, but for all of everything that Christ ever made. Most pinnacle point in history. I mean, can you imagine everyone in heaven, seraphims, cherubims, I mean, angels, anything else that God created we can't even imagine. Just looking down, wanting to know what's happening. Uh, curious to see the happenings that are going on, seeing what's going on. All of heaven is watching what's on the mind of Christ. We could jump and skip to the answer. It's us. It's us. For the last 4,000 years at this point, every sacrifice that was ever made was pointing to him, was pointing to this sacrifice, the sacrifice, the last sacrifice that ever needed to be made. Boy, there's a lot of things in the mind of Christ at this time that we cannot even comprehend and couldn't comprehend. I've heard it said something so long of this, with great wisdom comes great sorrow. Was that Spurgeon that said that? Um, boy, for, for, for the wise out there, I, I'm sure you can totally understand. Because whatever little bit of drop of wisdom that I think I get, boy, I, there's sorrow that comes with that. Getting the reality of the, 
the, the, the reality of the, of the depravity of man is a sad, scary thing. But in the same span, I deal with set point and span at work. You probably do too, Rob. Set point and span. We deal with hydraulic actuators. Just as bad as the, 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 the depravity of man, as bad as it is, the grace of God is, matches it every time. Right. I got to get to the message. Amen. Luke chapter 22, verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare? And, and here we have two Christians that love the Lord. They've no doubt accepted him as their personal savior. And Peter and John are given specific directions on what to do. Well, not just specific directions on what to do, but to how to do and where to do and when to do. Jesus was very specific in telling them what to do. Look at verse 10. And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entered in. Entereth in. And you shall say unto the good men of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. So Jesus has literally given Peter and John specific instructions on where to go, what to say, what to do when they get there. Look at verse 13. And they went in and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Brother Rob, would you open this service in a word of prayer, sir? Amen. It's really simple. Um, me and my wife were talking the other day, you know, um, smart people, smart people that are really smart and I look up to in many ways, um, I believe in their smartness miss simple things. And I'm sure that could be spanned across anything through life, but but the gospel message is simple. Yeah. And by and large, Scripture is simple. We just have to take the time to study it. Right. Uh, really. What, what's the gospel message? The, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Yeah. The road to happiness is simple. It's just obey the word of God. Yeah. Our flesh don't like it. Yeah. But that is literally, you, you want to be happy in life? Be obedient. Yeah. Get saved and be obedient. Man, that's where the happiness comes from. Amen. Truth is simple. Our world doesn't like that. And, and, and our rebellion, uh, the, the, the rebellious heart of every man doesn't like that because we want a gray area everything sure. to justify whatever. We want to make things sound, well, you know, my dad said we can't go here, but, you know, we can go right next door and we can talk to him and we can party with him even though there's a borderline here. You know, anything, anything in a rebellion, uh, uh, girls wearing dresses uh, too short. We're gonna say, well, he said up to the knee, but I'm going to go an inch higher. Well, it's really close to the knee. Um, you know, uh, drinking alcohol. Well, I, you know, I just, it's a social drink. Whatever it is, we, we put a gray area on it to try to make it sound for our just to justify our own sin. But the fact of the matter is, truth right. is simple. Yeah. But it's our sin that makes it. We, we muddy up the water, right? And we do the same thing with Bible doctrines. Really, there's, if we just, no, this is more than my opinion. This is more than my opinion. This is a fact. If you come to the scriptures with a preconceived idea that somebody's taught you, and I believe everybody in this room, including me, can be guilty of this, we can read scriptures and to read into scripture things that we wanted to say, what we've been taught. So what we got to do is we got to search the scriptures to see what God wants us to learn. Yeah. Not what we already have in our minds, right? Because we're, man, we're good at that. Amen. There's some things I haven't preached because I haven't studied it out for myself. <laughs> Let me move on. Amen. 
Um, this, there's, there's, there are things in Scripture that, particularly prophetic things, that take more study. But God gave it to us, a, a Scripture that is simple for all mankind. And there are some things that we need to study more on by design. Can I tell you that most of this entire Bible, man, I, I got to move on, but most of this entire Bible, anyone in here can read and study and understand without having some doctorate or some theologian. What we want to do, we want to muddy up the waters to justify why we don't want to study. Say, oh, it's just so hard because there's some great things in Revelation. That are just I can't study it all. So then we ignore all of the Gospels, all of Acts, all of Romans, all of the Pauline epistles that tell us how to live in the church in our daily lives. We want to ignore all that and muddy the waters for some deep theolo theological thing. Amen. Well, you, you want to talk about harder things to understand? Second half of Daniel, second half of Revelation. Everything else! Anybody in here could read and understand, just with a little bit of study in, a little bit of cross-reference. Amen. One person told me that the Bible is only for theologians to know. That is absolute hogwash. Uh, I think I mentioned this Wednesday, but I'll say it again. It fits. The, there's a, a man at my work just recently told me, he's like, yeah, I tried reading, but Revelation is too hard. It's got all these candlesticks and stars. You, he's just no way of knowing what those things are. I'm glad he used that for an, an analogy, right? Because God literally, I told him, God literally, right after it says candlesticks and stars and all these things, it says, and the candlestick is this, and the stars are this. It literally tells you what it is. So all of a sudden, those first seven chapters are really clear to understand if we take the time to study the scriptures. Matthew twenty two twenty nine 29 says, Jesus answered unto them, you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Our lives would be better if we knew the, the scriptures. Amen. We would have a better understanding of the power of God. Amen. Talking about studying to show ourselves approved. We want to be workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Psalms 119.9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to what? Thy word. Amen. Turn to Acts 17.11. Acts 17.11. I always think of you, Brother Zollers, whenever I read this scripture. <clears throat> Amen. I thank God for men in the church that will let me know where I, where I say something wrong. Amen. <laughs> Acts chapter 17, 11 says, there were, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures once a year. No, nope, daily. Where those things were so. Every, any church member does a disservice to themselves and to the entire church by not going home and studying what I'm preaching from. Because it doesn't mean that I'm always right. I don't think I preached anything that wasn't right. I, I do everything in my power to be careful of that. But I'm still human. And it is our job to be studying, making sure I'm in line. Amen. I forget what I said, brothers, always, but I said something like, we need to be like the, the, the church in Thessalonica, but it's the church in Berea, right? Yeah, amen. <laughs> don't ever cross me again. No. <laughs> amen. I feel, I feel bad saying that. Amen. Uh, amen. Look at verse 12. It says, therefore, and what would Pastor Ammon always say? What's the therefore, therefore? You, you know, um, when you come to the word therefore, it, it's now making a statement that um, what I'm about to say is because of what I just said. That's what that means, right? So, so, so and what is verse 11 talking about? I want to read it again. I want to read it again. These were, no, were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. Boy, that's important. And searched the scriptures daily whether the, those things were so. So now you have a oh, oh, whole congregation in, in, in Berea receiving the scriptures with all readiness of mind, daily searching the scriptures whether they were so. That's encouraging enough. But because they did that, look at the next verse. Therefore... Many of them believed. Also honorable women, which were of Greeks and of men, not a few. So what happened when the whole church was studying and reading the Bible, whether the things were so what we were preaching? People were getting saved. Things were happening in the church. Not just because the pastor was preaching and studying, but the whole congregation was studying, and amen, with readiness of mind. 
kind of begs the question, have you read your Bible in the last seven days? In the upcoming six days, are you planning on reading your Bible? Or have you already planned on not even opening it up and reading it? Do you plan on leaving it in your car, leaving it in the church pew, leaving it on the shelf, leaving it by the door? Do, what I'm saying is, are you already planning on not serving the Lord this week? It's a good time of year to beg the question, have, have you set any goals in your Bible study? I'm not even talking about prayer life. I'm not talking about coming to church. I'm not talking about um, witnessing on the street. I'm not talking about street preaching. I'm not talking about passing out tracts. Have you set any goals for yourself with reading scriptures this year? Because I speculate that most Christians don't. Um, I was given two, maybe three, two. I think two this year. Um, not that anybody has to give them to me, but just I know it's encouraging for me of people that read through their Bible this year. <clears throat> Four chapters a day is all it takes. You say, well, some chapters are long, I know, but some chapters are real short. <laughs> it, it comes out in the wash, amen. Four chapters a day, you read your whole Bible in a year. Amen. That's like 15 minutes. Yeah. It's not that much. Right. You want to read your whole Bible in six months? Spend 30 minutes or so a day. Eight chapters. Eight chapters. That's awesome. It, it, it's, not, it's not some unattainable thing. Amen. If you don't set time aside for anything, nothing will get done. Anybody that ever did anything or had any responsibility in their life at all knows this. And the more responsibility you have, the more you realize it. The more you realize, wow, my time is short and my free time. Amen. Uh, uh, our, our, our teenagers... Don't realize the free time that they have. Amen. You know, uh, uh, people, people before they get married still think they have a lot of free time until they get married. And then they still think they have free time. Then they have kids. Then all of a sudden, whoa, 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 whoa. Then you're excited to watch uh, um, uh, Judge Judy for an hour before you go to bed. I mean, like, you're thankful just to sit down for a minute. I remember, I don't know how long it was, Rachel, if it was months or into a year or two. But we hadn't been on a date in forever and ever and ever with, with our babies. And we went out on a date, and we were just so glad to go grocery shopping together. And it was thrilling, yet really sad, that we found ourselves on a Friday night at 9 o'clock at the clearance section at Kroger getting excited about what we're finding. Right. Amen. But you find that our time is short. And we're all guilty of prioritizing poorly. Because we have a flesh that just wants to sit in front of the TV. And, then you're, and, and I'm preaching this. And I'm telling you, I sat in front of a TV more a couple of weeks ago than I have in the last five years. Literally. <clears throat> I loved it. It was wonderful. I needed it. But that is not the way to live your life. Man, watch TV. Enjoy your time. Read a book. Enjoy it. Go fishing, man. Go fish. It's great. But let's, let's prioritize the Lord. Right. If we want to be happy in life, let, let, let's, let's prioritize this right here. Right. Man, we got this small lifespan. You say, yeah, we got, we got 70 years, give or take, you know, uh, 80 years, 90 years. People are running through my mind as I talk and I'm regretting the statements I'm making right now. <laughs> But realistically, you can't do a whole lot for the cause of Christ when you're five years old. Oh, you can pray, yeah. right? You can, there's things you can do and be an encouragement. But, but to be effective for the cause of Christ the, 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 is, is condensed to, to not when you're real young and not when you're real old and you can't get around. I'm not saying God can't use you in great ways, but, but we have this time in life. Yeah. Rob, but we're not stuck in a nursing home. 
right? We were, we were not stuck at home, laid up on, uh, in a bed somewhere we can't even get out, wishing, oh, I wish I would have done more for the kids. We're only talking about eternity to regret what we haven't done for Christ now. There is no one on the planet, I don't believe, nope, even Paul. I, I don't think there's no man in history that's not going to have regrets. Did I say that right? I think I said that right. Even Paul the Apostle's going to be thinking, man, I wasted so much of my life for Satan. Our life is short. I got to get moving here. Our eternal destiny is simple. Jesus. Before the cross, it was Jesus. It was the coming Messiah. After the cross, it's Jesus. The, the, the Messiah that came. Amen. Here's what I want to get to this morning. Could you imagine the Son of God that mankind's been waiting for for all these years? I mean, all the prophecies came true. I mean, the prophecies that are unreal. Like it could never happen unless it was literally a miracle. Comes real and now he is your friend, Jesus incarnate in the flesh, being one of the disciples. And can you imagine Jesus asking you to do something? That'd be a weight of responsibility. Even though it's just go get the Passover room ready and get and he gave him specific instructions. Wow, what a weight of responsibility. Uh, my, when my dad would tell me to do something growing up. That was a heavy weight because if I didn't do it, when he gets home, one, I get a spanking. Number two, I got to do it again. If it's not done again, I get another spanking. I got to do it over again. Can I tell you, I swept our back a cement area four times before I could go play one time. I didn't want to play by the time it was done. <laughs> Amen. But that's just my dad, and he would give us jobs to do before he get home, you know, uh, I was on a framing crew, and, and you'd have jobs to do. Hey, go build a laundry room over there. Go put a roof on that side of the house. And there's this weight of responsibility that comes with it. That's just, that's just earthly authority. That's just earthly authority. Um, it's one thing to obey your earthly father, earthly authority. But, boy, it's far more important to obey our heavenly father, our heavenly authority. We, we talk a big talk. And we look so good in our suits. We say this and we, we post on Facebook how great we are. But where the rubber meets the road, did we even plan on spending time with the Lord today? When the rubber meets the road, did we literally just not even really plan on getting our Bible out for the whole entire week because we'd rather watch whatever it is we want to watch and do whatever it is we want to do? Let's go back to our text, Luke chapter 22, verse 11. And you shall say unto the good men of the house, the master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had sent unto them, and they made ready the Passover. So Peter and John, they were obedient with what they had to do. They went to where they were supposed to go. Has your Lord ever told you to go anywhere? I don't even need to tell you to turn there. Hebrews 10, 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. Christians that are born again and trust in Christ seem to look for reasons to not be in the house of God. Amen. Paul said, and so much the more. Number one, they went uh, to where they were supposed to go. Two, they, they also followed the instructions once they got there. It's a real simple message. Are you following the instructions that God has laid out for you? Or, or, or are you never really uh, planning on following God's instructions in the first place? I think that happens more often than not. We get content in the, in the, in the comfortable zone that we're in, wherever that lot may be in life. We're comfortable. I'm doing more than so-and-so. We're comparing ourselves among ourselves. And what is that? Not wise. And all of a sudden we start thinking, you know, I'm okay because, you know, I'm more spiritual than so on. You know, I'm better than I've ever been in my life. And that's great. But that's not where God wants us. Better isn't, God wants more than just better than yesterday. If we're, if we're not closer to God than we were a week or two ago, then guess what? There's some backsliding going on. If 
Far too often it seems that the modern day child of God has no intention of seeking God's direction in life. Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. How does God direct our steps? He's not picking up one foot after another for us. You know, we're not so, he gave us a free will. We don't say, uh, go up to the, the, the fast food drive through line, and they say, uh, uh, hello, this is McDonald's, how can I help you? And we don't go, Lord, what should I get today? Right. No. He gave us a brain to think for ourselves. So how, God, how does God direct our steps? Like David so often talked about. He literally gave us an instruction manual. History, poetry, prophecy, mystery, affairs. Daniel still has nothing. But the problem is we don't. Consider it as a whole. That's, that's good to know. That's good for the preacher types to know. That's good for that person. I'm glad that they're serving God, but I don't even plan on opening my Bible this week. God's given us clear instructions in his word. Clear instructions on all of these doctrines. Clear instructions on marriage. Clear instructions on how to behave ourselves. Clear instructions on where to go, where we should not go. Amen. Don't raise your hand, please. Because I'd be embarrassed of how my life has gone in this aspect. But how many times you come to a question in life, and you don't even consider what the Bible says. Should I go, should I go drinking with my buddies? Yeah, I do whatever I want to do. I don't care what God thinks about it. Should I get a tattoo? I don't, I don't care what God thinks about it. I'm going to do what I want to do about it. Um, should I go, um, sh should I try those drugs? Should I go to this party? Should I dress like this? I, name it. Uh, how should I act in my marriage? Should I get a divorce? What's God's standards for divorce? Name it across the board. You got an issue in life? Right. Look to the word Amen. and study it out. Right. We all could do it better. But that needs to be our number one, not our last resort. When it's all over, we got nowhere else to go. Then when we hit rock bottom, say, what's the word of God had to say about it? It's not complicated. You know, that Jeff Foxworthy, are you smarter than a fifth grader? Are we smarter than God? No. No, we're, we're just not. We're just not. It's a really simple message this morning. I gave out a challenge uh, last year, this time of the year, for anyone and everyone to take three months and study something. Right. Anything. Right. Anything. To study one topic for three months. Maybe some did, maybe some didn't, I don't know. I'm going to throw out the same thing. Just, just take the next three months. Take some, prioritize your time to learn what God has to say about something. Amen. That way we can go the rest of our lives, not just saying well, what my preacher says, what the church, no, I study it out for myself. I know what the Bible says about that topic because I studied it. This is what God thinks about it. Now all of a sudden, we have a better understanding of the mind of Christ. Now all of a sudden, our worship is better. Right. Now all of a sudden, whatever that part of our life that we, that we studied about, man, that's way better because we, we are walking in the steps that God has for us. If, if I could, I would let God move my steps where we go. I would. Boy, that'd be easier, wouldn't it? Just let him make all the decisions for us like that. You might say, well, I think Pastor Gunther's too strict with music or uh, dress or... Uh, we should have had Sunday school Christmas morning or um, uh, he wears a suit coat while he preaches or he should have a tablet instead of papers, right? Here's the thing. Whatever it is that you have a strong opinion, hey, maybe try to get a biblical understanding for your stance first instead of whatever 
uh, Disney's telling us, or Hollywood, because we spend more time getting our, uh, our information from Simpsons and Friends and Beavis and Butthead. And I'm not even being funny. This is truth. And then we get all this, our, our standards for life from what we get from the TV as opposed to, hey, what's the Bible say? Man, I disagree with that preacher. Or I disagree with Tony and Brother Jim. He's so wrong on that. Even though you may have never even studied the topic. What's God say about now all of a sudden? Now maybe the preacher's wrong on something. And you study, you, you, and you could show them. Preacher, look at this. This is what God says. Now all of a sudden we got something to talk about. Now all of a sudden we can talk about a standard, but it might just be that the preacher sets some standards according to some bi biblical truths. It might just be. And I'm not saying I'm always right or ever will be, but I'm always right. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Amen. <laughs> they went to where they were supposed to go. They followed the instructions once they got there, and they followed through and made ready. I bet there was an excitement in their spirit as they were doing it. God asked them to do something. Wow. I, I, wow. Can, can I ask you this morning, are you ready for Christ to come back? Are you ready for the rapture to happen? Are you ready to spend all of eternity from now and forever looking back at your life and saying, yeah, I'm real proud of what I did for Christ? I think the answer to every one of us would be, man, I could have done more. I could have done more. Turn to 1 Peter 3.15. 1 Peter 3.15. says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You say that you're a Christian and, and, and thank God if you are, if you're born again, amen, that's step one. But are you ready to give an answer to the gospel to anyone that asks? If you're not, there's a problem. There's a problem, a serious problem. It's a red flag saying that you're not in the word. You're not looking for direction from the Lord. You say that you're called to preach. Have you made a message ready in case you're needed? Amen. You say that you want to serve the Lord. Have you made things ready? Have you, have you gotten the things out of your life that are holding you back from moving forward with your relationship with Christ? Have you set aside all the excuses for not reading and studying your Bible? Because we all have them. And sometimes, man, you're just tired and don't want to get up and do nothing. For me, the hardest service is Wednesday night to come to. I've been working usually. Now I work less than I used to. But, man, I used to really work hard on a roof or something. Man, Wednesday nights, I just, especially in the wintertime, once you get in, man, you know, when you get in on a, on a cold day, Man, it's hard to get out of the house. You might as well not even go in the house and get warm when it's wintertime because it's hard to get out. And some Wednesdays, it's hard to get out, particularly in the cold of winter. But, man, I'm so glad once the service starts that I'm here. Man, I'm Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday night. I, I, I love being in the house of God and so much the more. Peter and John were found faithful in obedience, and they were able to reap the rewards of it. You say, well, yeah, yeah, there are rewards. They had eternity in heaven, eternity with Christ. and yeah, yeah, but more than that, they had rewards on this earth. Right. They, they got the privilege of having the last supper with Christ. I don't think they realized it was the last supper, amen, but it certainly was. They got to partake in... The timeless last supper with the high priest and the sacrificial lamb all at the same time. They were so blessed because they were able to experience the benefits of being a Christian before the promise of heaven. Folks, that's us too. Amen. We can enjoy the benefits of being obedient and doing what the word tells us to do. To being directed by his word, to being happy if we would just follow his word more than just being at a church service or saying that we're a Christian in general. Peter and John witnessed uh, Jesus heal the sick and give sight to the blind, casting out spirits, cleansing lepers, raising the dead. Can I tell you as a child of God, I've seen God heal people. I've seen God answer prayers. You know, when God answers a prayer, that's miraculous. There are benefits to living as a child of God when we're 
obedient and listening earnestly to what he's telling us so much more than when we're not. When hard times come in my life, it is so good that your heart's right with the Lord. Because I've been there, and I'm sure you have too. When hard times come in your life and your heart isn't right, and you're not where you're supposed to be, that is a miserable, miserable existence. Oh, you can numb it with TV. And you can numb it with drinking whatever, smoking whatever. But boy, it's nothing greater than having your heart right with God. Because all of a sudden, all things now work together for good to them that love the Lord. All of a sudden, the whole mentality changes. Hey, this is a hard time, but God's allowing it for my good. That is awesome. Turn to Revelation chapter 19, verse 5. Peter and John, they made ready the, and partook in the greatest Passover supper of the Lamb with God incarnate. That's Jesus in the flesh. Can I tell you as we close here that all of us who are saved are going to partake in the greatest celebration literally of all time called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it's going to be awesome. I hope you're making preparations now, being obedient now. Because there's, there's a whole lot of benefits now in this life that we can enjoy because we're making ourselves ready, amen, doing what he's telling us to do. Look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 5. It says, And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is coming and his wife and made herself ready. Who is the wife? That's the church. That's church unequivocally. Uh, there's things that can be debated in Scripture. I really believe that cannot even be debated. I think Scripture is so clear on that. In closing, have you made yourself ready for the marriage of the Lamb? Number one, have you been born again? That's step one. <laughs> That's the most important thing. If you haven't accepted Christ as your personal Savior, then you are lost on your way to a devil's hell. It wasn't even made for mankind. It was made for the devil and his angels. Are you serving God with all that he's given you? Like the talents that were handed out? Some used them. Some buried them. Some threw them away. Some squandered them. We all have 24 hours in a day, 365 days a year. We all have the same amount of time on this earth. What are we doing with it? Or do we spend all of our time literally avoiding his word? Sunday morning is over. I'm going to put that on the shelf. i see you in a week. Even though that is literally for the child of God, we're anybody, but, but that is literally our source of happiness. Right. Yet our flesh don't like it because we'd rather literally watch TV. The message this morning is very simple. The gospel is very simple. In church, our instructions are real simple. It's just that our flesh don't like it. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I pray that you'd move in this invitation time. Lord, you bless us in spite of ourselves.